after series for parents and caregivers entitled You and Your Youth. Uh, tonight's topic asking, are they doing too much? So Dr. Syra is going to be here to help us answer that question. Uh, my name is Rick Lodell and I'm the manager of community projects and partnerships for New Westminster Schools. I'm based out of the new uh, Welcome Centre and Wellness Centre at New Westminster Secondary School. Uh, before we get started, I would like to recognize and acknowledge the Kakite First Nation as well as all Coast Salish peoples on whose traditional and unceded territories we live, we learn, we play, and we do our work. Uh, for our presentation tonight, cameras and microphones will be off. Uh, we encourage you to utilize the chat function uh, for questions. Dr. Syra is very interactive with her presentations, as you, uh, as many of you may know. So uh, get those fingers ready for some typing. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, someone that at least I think most of you will know by now. Uh, Dr. Cyrus Abzali is a registered clinical counselor with a PhD in transpersonal psychology. She is the clinical Director at Dra of Dragonfly Wellness Center, an online hub for mental health, personal growth, and counseling. She works with adults from diverse cultural backgrounds who are looking for a new approach to mental health. She specializes in depression, anxiety, family harmony, and burnout. Dr. Syra also runs support groups for women and newlyweds, has a free podcast, and provides teaching videos through Dragonfly Wellness TV on YouTube. And again, we are so grateful she is here with us tonight. Dr. Syra, thank you. So welcome back for those who are here for the third um, session and for those who this is your first one or your second one, they're not really connected to each other per se. So you, you could just, you, you'll get everything that you need to get today. Um, but we do encourage you to go and check out um, session one and session two if you haven't already. Um, they are posted, I believe, um, on the Wellness Center website, Rick, if I'm not mistaken. And they're also posted on Dragonfly Wellness TV, which is my YouTube channel. So check, check out either place. Um, and you can catch up <laughs> if you like today. So let's get started. Um, today we are looking at, um, are they doing too much? So today we're looking specifically at a certain kind of teenager. So your ambitious teenager. So for those who are here um, live, it would be interesting for me to know um, if you are a parent or a caregiver or an educator and what, how old the teenagers or the youth in your care um, are. So if you could just type that in the chat, that would be great. So then I get a sense of who's here. So there's some people who have kind of younger teens, some people who have in the 15, 17, 12 year old, 11, 15, 18. Okay, so let's get started. But this, are they doing too much strategies to support your ambitious teenager? So I always like to talk about what's our plan um, for the next 60 minutes or so. Um, so there's three parts. First, we're going to look at the context um, and talk a little bit about what, you know, what the kind of philosophical foundations are that this um, information is coming from. Then we're going to go into stress and coping. Um, and I have some interesting models and um, research to share with you there. And then finally, we're going to close um, with with mental health and, and specifically looking at how to support our, our youth um, with their with maintaining optimal mental health. So I want to start with the philosophical background. Um, there's two kind of, uh, shall we say, theories that, that, that inform this, this presentation and the other presentations that I've offered um, in this series. So one is attachment. Um, attachment is, it, it's looking more at the bond between the parents and the child or the caregivers or the adults and the child. Um, in attachment work, we really trust um, the instincts that a parent would have when they are centered and grounded and not emotionally dysregulated because those are not instincts that is something else but when you're regulated when you're steady um, you'll probably know what your kid needs right it's when we're kind of off balance or off center or um, there's kind of chronic challenges with the child then sometimes we get confused and so I want to remind everyone that you're exactly the parent that your kid needs I firmly believe that um, deeply and totally that your child needs you and they might need you to be balanced and centered and grounded as much as you can, but they need you. Your particular flavor um, of parenting is what 
what's going to help them thrive. And so attachment parent, attachment theory really looks at that parent-child bond and how it's not so much about strategies and techniques. It's mostly about the bond and ensuring that that bond um, stays strong. And when there is rupture to the bond, that we quickly move into repair. And I like this theory, not just for raising teenagers, but for like socializing in, in general with humans, right? That they're, you know, saying the right thing or doing the right thing is different than the feeling that you have when, when you can just be yourself around someone. And that's what we're hoping to give our youth is that feeling that they can just be themselves. And, you know, you may have some, some questions or some um, suggestions for them around the choices that they're making. We'll get into how to articulate that to them, but we want them to um, feel confident and comfortable that they can be themselves and you and trusting that you're the parents that are the best parents for them. The other um, the other piece that's underpinning is family systems. Now family systems looks at the the family as not just separate individual people, but as a, a, a web. And so when things change in one part of the family, things change in the whole family. And the family system can be, you know, your nuclear family. Um, it also would might include extended family, um, people who feel like family, kind of that, that wider parts of the web. So in the center of the web is your nuclear family, and then there's other layers to the web. And the hope is that somebody in the family system is kind of interested in learning and growth and interested in change. Um, and, and because otherwise we have that intergenerational patterns that happen, right? Where we just do the same thing that was done to us. And so usually in a family system, there's somebody or maybe a couple of people who are interested in changing the family story. And so I'm guessing if you're here, that actually might be you. So that's the philosophical background. Um, for questions, I would love to take questions as we go. So if you have a question as we're going, just type it in the chat and then I'll be able to address it as we go. So I, I wanted to take a moment and, and really talk about high achievers because that's kind of the focus target um, that we're talking about today. Those youth that have that are ambitious, that, that want to achieve. Um, now, whether they're able to or not, that's that's another story. But I, I kind of have these different images here. So there may be someone who's, you know, we think of high achievers, generally, we think of academics, um, but there's other ways of being high achievers, right? There's people who maybe music and drama or the arts, uh, maybe sports. So there may be different ways that your child or the person that you're looking after is engaging in the world, but their standards are high, right? So it's not, they're not, they're not, it's not enough for them just to get by. They want to be the best at whatever it is that they're um that they're doing so that might be um similar to how you were when you were a youth it might be different from how you were when you were a youth and one of the things i'll get you to keep going back to is what was i like as a young person because <laughs> you may have a child who you can really relate to like oh i was just like that or you may have a child who you just have no idea how to relate to them because they're so different than you were and and we need to be able to navigate in either one of those scenarios so just bringing it back to your own experience what was it like for me can be helpful in um supporting you in navigating the parenting you know landscape so i'm going to pause here for a moment um, and talking about high achievers so what do you think might be so i'd love for you to type in the chat um, as i ask this question what do you think might be a challenge for a high achieving youth what 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 might be one of the barriers or the obstacles that a high achieving youth may face any ideas uh making mistakes yeah we don't know what we don't want to make mistakes somebody's saying they want perfection Absolutely. Making mistakes, perfection. What else? Maintaining top grades, right? So not just doing well, but the top of the, the top of the top. Um, Self-criticism, huge challenge and issue um, for high achievers. Expectations and their own expectations and other people's expectations. Stress management, right? How do we, how do we actually support our youth if they have high expectations of themselves? They're a bit self-critical. They want perfection. They have a lot of stress. Um, they they want to maintain, like, to be at the top of the top. Uh, a good one, unable to say no, right? So if they're high achieving and they get another opportunity that will beef out their college application or whatever it is, they might just say yes because they, they want to do the next thing and the next thing. And so these are some of the, the barriers that can come up um, for youth that are high achieving. But if you think about it, these are also barriers that could come up for adults who are high achieving, isn't it? 
right? High expectations of yourself, want things to be perfect, not knowing how to manage your stress very well, unable to say no, somebody's adding sleep issues. Um, yeah, so all of these things can be be problematic um, for youth. And as adults, having some of these challenges, you know, we, we sometimes have a, a few more tools on how to kind of navigate and cope with these challenges, but our youth may not. Um, our youth may feel more limited in, in so far as how do I continue being a high achiever um, and manage these barriers. They might not actually articulate to you that they have any of these barriers, but it's important for you to kind of have it in the back of your mind if you have a youth who's a high achiever, that these are some of the things that can happen. Another thing that happens with high achievers is comparison, right? So, and both ways. So comparing and saying I'm better, right? I'm smarter, I'm faster, I'm a better um, actor, whatever it is than others, but also comparison in saying, I'm not as good as. See, one of the things that um, the teenage brain allows for, we talked about this in our last session, is the teenage brain can now start to finally see the ideal of something. So the ideal teacher or the ideal parent or the ideal self. Um, before the teenage years, the child brain cannot do that. And so once the teenager can see the ideal, now they're measuring against that ideal. And they're going to be measuring themselves against that ideal. And they're likely going to be assuming that everybody around them is also measuring them <laughs> against that ideal. So these, these are some of the challenges with, with high achieving youth. For those who do have youth who are um, high achieving, also very sensitive um, from an emotional perspective, really, really deep feelers or big feelers, um, and also have kind of a pulsing need to make a difference in the world. If those three criteria are met for you, for your youth, I would highly recommend this book. It's called Journey into Your Rainforest Mind uh, by Paula Prober. And it's the subtitle is A Field Guide for Gifted Adults and Teens, Book Lovers, Overthinkers, Geeks, Sensitives, Brainiacs, Intuitives, Procrastinators, and Perfectionists. So it's a really fun, lighthearted read. Um, so if you feel like your child is those three things, so high achieving, um, very, very emotionally, like big emotion or deep emotion, and a pulsing need to help in the world that would be a good read for you. It's an easy read. It's, a, it's quite a funny, um, enjoyable read. So that's the little piece around high achieving. And I could probably do a whole workshop on high achieving, but we will just, uh, we'll leave it at that for now. And so that's the context, the philosophical context and, and who this particular presentation is, is targeted towards. So I want to um, talk a little bit about stress and coping. We uh, we live in a culture that really values busyness. Um, we value uh, ambition, we value achievement, um, and especially in the youth years, in the teenage years, when children are preparing maybe to go on to higher education, there's this kind of push, there's this kind of constant push and pressure. And I wanted to share with you this stress cycle which helps us to understand why, you know, where the danger zones are for our children um, and what we might be able to, like where we can maybe intervene and, and do something. So the thing that, the, how we start, how we start, and, and again, you can think about this for yourself as an adult, it applies to adults as well, um, this stress cycle. So what happens is first you get busier, right? And so we often see this in like October, November with, with students, like September, there's kind of coming back to school, October, November, like things start to get a bit hairy and more busy for, for, for young people. Um, they may end up engaging less in their self-care. So they may end up, um, you know, skipping showers or not actually having downtime with their friends or um, not doing the things that they just used to do for pleasure. Like if they like to read or if they like to listen to music, maybe they're doing less of those things that are just for them, just to feel relaxed. Um, and there's a feeling of being stressed. And like somebody else said, um, they can't say no. They're having a hard time saying no. So when this starts to, to, to kind of build, we, we start to increase the, the levels of, the, like the stress hormones in our physical body start to increase. So that's cortisol, adrenaline, start going up and up and up and up and up. Now, what happens at some point, so what's supposed to happen is that we feel stressed, our stress goes up, there's some sort of an intervention right? So we do something about that stress, and then we come back down. And the stress cycle is supposed to just be this little thing that happens here. Because some stress is actually healthy for us, right? It's some stress, some pressure actually uh, makes us perform better. We know this from the research. 
But when we're chronically stressed, when our body is flooding itself constantly with this stress hormone, um, that's when things get out of line and, and out of balance. The body can only take so much activation before it starts to now like kind of adjust itself around, right? The body and the psyche, we need to adjust around that stress. And so what ends up happening is that we um, acclimatize, right? We become used to these extreme levels of stress. And that's actually where the danger, <laughs> the danger happens, because we don't even know we're stressed anymore. We're stressed, but we don't even feel it anymore. And so we're kind of functioning at this high level of intensity and stress. And people around us, people around the youth might say, oh, you know what, you need to like slow down and you're doing so much and you're stretching yourself too thin and they'll hear this, but they actually will feel fine. So they won't really believe you when you say you need to slow down because they've acclimatized right? They've become used to these levels of stress. And then something happens. Something will happen. I call it the straw that breaks you, right? Some event um, will happen where suddenly it's, that's the last thing. And then there'll be this rapid decline, this fall, this crash, right? We call it a crash. Nervous breakdown is sometimes what we call just the crash and then leading to crisis and burnout. So as adults, this is kind of how some of us just function, which is not healthy. But for the adolescent brain, this is extremely unhealthy because their brains are developing, their creative, their create, their creativity is coming alive, their all the connections are happening in their neural networks. And if they do these crashes, that actually sets them back. So what we want to help our youth do is when they're starting this, you know, increased busyness, less, less self-care, self-care. This is where as adults, um, we can support them because here they're still listening. They still, they feel the, the pressure and the stress. Once they're up here, it's going to be hard for them to hear you because they actually don't feel bad. They feel fine. So this is where we can actually be kind of a second set of eyes and not in a way of forcing or pushing because we want our children to know that we believe in you. We know you can do hard things and there needs to be breaks in the middle. Now, this is hard if you yourself as an uh, adult role model are not modeling self-care. So, <laughs> so you also have to work on taking rest, taking breaks, not letting yourself get it to the point where you're too busy and too stressed and not being able to say no. So the, one of the things, the best things that we can do for our children is live a life that we wish they could live rather than tell them to live a life we wish they would live, actually live that life ourselves. So that's where we have to kind of bring it back and that personal accountability and that role modeling becomes really important. So that is the stress cycle. I'm gonna take a moment. Um, I'm gonna put this, the image back up and just take a moment here to see if there's any questions um, about the stress cycle. So if there are, you can write them in the chat. Let's take a moment to look at this again. Do you have questions? So no questions coming through yet. If you think of something, type it in the chat and I can loop back to it. Uh, so someone's saying the, the visual is extremely helpful. Yeah, and, and I encourage you, you know, this is being recorded. So I encourage you to share that image with your, with your young person and say, hey, look, this is what can happen if we keep, if we keep going up and up and up. Eventually, you'll just acclimatize. With burnout, how would it look like for a teenager? Great question. So for teenagers, burnout can look a few different ways. It can look like um, sudden apathy, like they suddenly just don't care anymore. They're not in the things that they used to be really interested in or passionate about, they've stopped caring about. Um, burnout can also look like, um, we'll actually talk about this a little bit near the end when we talk about the mental health continuum. Um, but one of the other things that can happen is that they can become kind of more moody than usual. Like <laughs> you kind of have to kind of see like on your child's moodiness scale, you know, your child might be a three on moodiness. Somebody else's child might be a seven. If the three is suddenly turning into a seven, there's something to think, you know, something's going on there. Um, if they're becoming more, more, I would say not moody. I wouldn't use that word. I would say emotionally dysregulated, right? They're having a hard time regulating their emotions. Um, that's another sign of burnout. Another thing is that they isolate themselves and they're no longer wanting to kind of be around 
um, their loved ones or their the people that they usually enjoy spending time with, these are some signs that that your teenager may be um, getting burnt out. So I want to switch gears now and share with you some research. So the Search Institute, um, been around since the 60s, late 60s, and has it's, a, it's an organization that's actually very, very interested in um, researching youth and looking at, you know, what is it that, that that's kind of the, the target group. And when I say youth, I mean about the 13 to 18 year olds is there was their initial kind of focus area. Um, and so they've done all of these different experiments and research over the years. And there's in the last uh, about about 20, 15 years or so, um, they've come up with this 40 asset model. And so what they've done is they've distilled down what are the um, ingredients, what are the ingredients for a child to um, thrive, basically, as a teen, as a teenager, what are the ingredients for teenagers to thrive? And what they found was that when youth have, the more of these assets that youth have, the less likely they are to engage in risk-taking behavior. So um, underage drinking, promiscuity, um, taking risks around, um, you know, driving or, um, you know, other behaviors that, you know, you would kind of worry about. They're less at risk to do these behaviors. Now, you might be surprised in what we talk about because what many people think and say is, oh, as long as they don't fall into the wrong crowd, we'll be fine. Right. Like we, that's kind of the narrative that we have. It's like it's the crowd. We got to make sure they're in the right crowd. If they're in the right crowd, then they won't do risky things. That's actually not what the research tells us. The research tells us that there's actually a lot more inputs besides um, crowd. The other thing we sometimes say is, oh, self-esteem. If a child is confident, then they won't be pressured to do things that um, they wouldn't otherwise do. That's true to a degree. And the crowd piece is also true to a degree. But those are only two of the 40 assets that can be helpful um, for youth to stay kind of on. And I wouldn't say the right track, but on the track that's the most um, nurturing and nourishing for their development, for their growth. Right. Everybody doesn't have to be like a good kid, but to, to be able to move in a direction where you're, they're becoming the kind of adult that you know that they could be. And some of that will be, you know, there will be rebellion. There will be all of that as part of the process. But they're moving in that general direction of um, becoming a well-adjusted member of society. So what are those 40 assets? Um, you don't have to memorize this. There's no test at the end. <laughs> These are the categories. So there's eight different categories of um, that we need to think about as far as providing for our youth or surrounding our youth with. So I'm going to go into each of these categories. We're going to take a little bit of time here um, because I do think that there's real value in um, this research and what and what they found. So the four, the eight categories are support, use of time boundaries and expectations, commitment to learning, empowerment, positive values, social competencies, and positive identity. So I thought what we might do is do kind of a little bit of a game with this. Um, and so that way, you know, it's, it, you're not just listening to information, you're also applying it to your life. So what I'd like you to do, if you have a pen and paper with you, is um, we're, we're going to go through these assets. We're going to go through them kind of, I'm going to explain each one. What I'd like you to do is give yourself a tally mark if you as a teenager had that asset, okay? And then on the, on the other side of the page, give your youth a tally mark if they have this asset. Now, for those who are educators, you might not be able to do it in the same way, so then just do it for yourself. But for those who are parents, think about the youth that you're that you're kind of working with. It might be one, it might be three, however many teenagers you have at home, and, and put a tally mark for any asset that they have. The other thing um, as we're going through this that I would encourage you to do is if there's a particular asset that really grabs your attention and you think, oh, that would be a really good thing. I would love to introduce that to my kid. Make a note of it. Okay, make a note of it because you'll you'll see in a, in a moment here that it's not just about self-esteem and the crowd. There's a lot of other things and there's things that we as parents can actually influence um, to ensure that our children are, are well supported and surrounded by by the right people and the right opportunities. So here we go. We're going to dive in now to this. So 
let's start with these two assets. So support and empowerment. Now, this is still in the area, the topic area of stress and coping, because these assets are actually what help our youth to cope. And not having access to some of these things are actually what cause our youth to flounder. And so that's why it's in the same, same category here. Okay, so support. So there's, um, and in no particular order, that's why they're kind of all over the place, because it's not like one is more important than the other, but there's five different areas um, in support that are important for students, so, so for youth. And it's not just like we might think um, having good friends, right? Like they should have good friends and that would be support. No, that's actually none of it, <laughs> none of it in this particular area. So one thing is that the parents are involved in schooling. The parents are interested in their the work that they're doing. They might have some sort of contact, um, maybe maybe hand, like, you know, arm's length, not the same as it was in elementary school, but a bit of an arm's length connection, but they know what's going on in the school. They know what's going on with their child as far as where they're struggling, where they're excelling. Family support. So not just nuclear family, but extended family support, that the child feels like there's other adults in the family and other young people in the family that, that, that they can turn to when things are not going so well, that they feel supported by their family, including extended to so grandparents, aunts and uncles, etc. A caring neighborhood, that actually creates um, a, a kind of a social padding for our youth. So, you know, in the, in the many of the societies, many of the, in the cities, you know, if you're living in the city, it, it may not be that you've developed that caring neighborhood. And maybe you have, maybe you're, you've been in the same neighborhood since they were kids, since they were really little kids. And so you have a group of, you know, <laughs> young people that have grown up together. Um, but it's not as much about the other kids in the neighborhood. It's much more about the adults in the neighborhood. So getting to know your neighbors and introducing your youth to your neighbors is an important aspect. And it might they might feel like they might roll their eyes about it, but one of the ways to create those caring neighborhoods is to encourage our youth to, um, to, to engage in acts of service. So a simple one would be mowing the lawn. Summer's coming, right? So if your youth is the person in the household that mows the lawn once in a while, maybe they also mow the neighbor's lawn, right? If your neighbor is a neighbor who would appreciate that. Um, maybe in the fall, maybe shovel, uh, like raking leaves or shoveling snow, just them starting to go into the neighborhood and, and being known in the neighborhood in some way. It's really important. And I know it's it's different than when, you, you know, you and I were growing up, that society has changed a lot and we don't necessarily have those kind of connected neighborhoods. But if we can develop even with one or two neighbors in your area, um, that makes a difference. I want to, um, a story that I've told before, I don't know, maybe to this group or maybe not. Um, so I, in our neighborhood, so we've moved to a little tiny town. And so it really has that caring neighborhood feeling like it's just built in because it's a tiny town. And one of the things that I've noticed is that other adults will talk to me about my son. <laughs> Say like, he's such a pleasant young man and blah, blah, blah. So other adults are noticing him and they're in a complimentary way. And so I'm trying to do the same with some of the youth in, in the neighborhood, kind of getting, trying to get to know them a little bit, even just with a smile or a good morning and just starting to build a little bit of a relationship so that the youth have other adults besides their parents who are watching out for them, right? Because if something happens and they, they, they don't have the gumption or the power or to get support right away and you happen to be there and see it, maybe you're a trusted adult that will be able to come to the rescue if needed. Not that it'll be needed that much, but it's nice for them to know that people in this neighborhood care about me and they know me. Other adult relationships, so, so critical, right? Um, so whether that's, again, aunts and uncles, cousins, family members, whether that's uh, teachers, coaches, um, just other people, scout, scout leaders, whoever, other adults that support the youth and kind of celebrate the youth for who they are and aren't trying to change them. Positive family communication. So this is where the child feels like they can actually talk to you about stuff, right? They can actually share with you and you're not going to jump down their throat. You're not going to make them wrong and bad. You're actually going to take a minute and, and listen. Um, and when you're asking for things, that you do it in a way that honors them as people. So one of the one of the tricks that you might want to use is um, in this particular area is when you're angry, <laughs> when you're angry, think about if this were somebody else's kid, would I use the following words? 
if this were somebody else's, not my kid, but if this were my, you know, my sister's kid or my neighbor's kid or another kid at school, how would I communicate in this moment to that child? And what that does is it kind of gives you that the a moment to breathe and uh, a real a kind of an internal reality check of like, what am I just about to say to my child right now? How am I going to articulate myself in this moment? Because, you know, it just, it feels so much easier. I don't know. It feels easier to me to look after other people's children than my own children sometimes, right? Because it's like, I don't know what I'm doing with my own children, but I can definitely love other people's children. So just kind of running that question by yourself, um, is that will help with positive family communication because you're actually setting the tone of how we talk to each other in this household, right? Do we um, make jabs at each other? Do we put each other down? Do we have, do we name call? Or do we um, minimize those behaviors when they're coming up in the family? Do we actually stomp that out and say, no, that's not how we talk to each other in this house? So in small families where there's no extended family, it's then it could be your built family, right? So that could be your close friends that that you've kind of brought into your circle and feel like family. It doesn't necessarily have to be like blood related, but the people who you think of as your your chosen family, um, that could also be uh, a, a, a touch point. And I know there are families, I was actually working with a woman a couple of months ago who, you know, it was just basically her, her partner and her kids, and they didn't really kind of branch outside of that. And now that her kids are fully grown and married, there's this strange thing that's happening because there's only a family of two left because the kids are like off and gone and they never took time to actually build community around their family. So I would highly encourage you to build community around your family. We're social mammals. We can't do this alone. We were never intended to do this alone. So even if you don't have grandparents, aunts and uncles, whatever, you can bring in, you know, I my kids have aunties and uncles who are not related to us and who are like family. Great questions, keep them coming. So that's support. So as you can see, it's nothing about friends, nothing about other kids. It's about adults um, and, and the spaces that they're in. Empowerment. So we want our kids to feel a sense of safety. We want to promote a community that values youth. And so giving youth an opportunity to shine in the community is really important, to seeing our youth as resources. Um, and that service to others piece, children who are engaged in service to others, who, who um, have been told that they're a resource, who have been told that they're valuable by their communities, they just feel better about themselves and they're not trying to push back and prove as much. They're not rebelling and pushing as much. Um, we wanna empower them, right? They're coming to a stage in life where it's going to be like just in a very short window of very few years, they're going to be launched and they're going to be kind of in the world as adults. And so if we do everything for them, um, we don't set them up to succeed in that way. Service to others, I, I would say, is one of the most easy ones to start implementing in your family right away. Right. And sometimes it's easier to do service to others outside the family, <laughs> the neighbors or, you know, other people, um, because then there's no you know, that, that dynamic isn't there. Um, but even within the family, I know that my, my sister just had triplets. And so one of the things we're doing is my 13 year old is going to be coming over for three weeks and helping look after the babies and serving the moms and, you know, making sure that they have their food and they have like what they need so that the babies will be okay. And that's, he, we're not paying him for that. That's service. Service doesn't mean you get paid. It means you're giving of yourself without any compensation. That's really important. Any questions about um, support or empowerment? If you have them, type them in the chat and we'll move to the next part. Okay. So the next two, boundaries and expectations and use of time. Um, high expectations actually are good for our kids. Not unrealistic, crazy high expectations, but Expecting them to do well, kids who are expected to do well will likely do better than kids who are not expected to do well. Um, and not just do well academically, but do well socially, um, you know, do their part, participate. You having high expectations as the, the primary caregivers is good for your kids. Now, when you have high achieving kids, their expectations may be higher than, <laughs> than yours, which can become problematic sometimes. But that expectations piece is important. Neighborhood boundaries. They need to know in the neighborhood what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. 
right? I remember when I was a teenager, I was about 16, and it was my 16th birthday and felt so cool. And I got everyone to like, we all dressed up the same, wearing blue jeans, white t-shirts, like so creative. And <laughs> we were like, and we had the, okay, do you remember the boom box? Do you remember when we had like a physical thing that would make noise in the public? And we were like listening to, I remember this on my 16th birthday, like, on the bus with the boom box and like playing the music feeling so cool and the bus driver was like excuse me kids turn down that volume <laughs> and that was a boundary right and we did like oh yeah but we knew what was expected in our neighborhood right we were trying to push it a little bit but we knew what was expected we knew that we were doing something that was out of the boundaries by listening to this boom box so for kids to know that there's limits within the neighborhood of how you can behave same with school, right? School, schools having clear boundaries about what's acceptable behavior and what's unacceptable behavior. Um, family boundaries, right? What, what are some of the things we simply don't do in this family? What are some of the words that we simply don't use, for example? And it's harder to enforce that if you haven't been doing that since they were little, um, but it's still possible. It's still possible. Like one of the family boundaries that you might um, Maybe you go for a, a weekly walk together and that's just expected. Everybody's got to be there for that walk. And there's no negotiation about that, right? Having some of those um, expected family time pieces is really important. Even though it takes a lot of effort on the parents' part, really important. There, there needs to be adult role models, people in their lives who they look up to, as we've mentioned before. And here's where we get to the positive peer influence. But notice it doesn't say friends. It doesn't say friends. It says peer influence so that they're around other peers that are positive influences. They may or not actually be engaged. So one of the things that sometimes we um, we miss is we think that if our kids have good friends, then they'll be OK. That's one piece, very small piece of it. Right. But they can have two or three friends and really not be OK because all of these other pieces aren't there. Right. So they could have positive peer influence, but have no boundaries, no neighborhood school, no role models, no expectations. They're going to they're not going to thrive. So it's just one piece, the positive peer influence. This is really important use of time. It's important for youth to spend time at home doing not much. Sitting in their rooms, doing not much. It's important. Youth who don't get that. And um, that's what also uh, contributes to that burnout and that crash and burn. Um, they need time at home. Kids who spend time at home, especially if parents are kind of hovering in the background, tend to just be less at risk because there's an adult watching. We think because they're big now that they don't need us as much. They actually do. They do need us kind of in the background, but they do need us at home. So here and there. So spending time at home is really important. Um, being involved in youth programs is really is really helpful for our kids. Um, engaging in creative activities. This is a really important one because the like young people they have so much inside of them already. Like they have so many ideas, they have so many questions. And so when they're creative, they get a chance to ex um, like express and kind of like um, dump out <laughs> everything that's inside of them. So whether that creativity looks like they're maybe they're writing, maybe they're uh, making music, maybe they're um, painting, maybe they're dancing, like anything that, that's a creative, a place for them to move all of what's inside of them. And, you might be involved or not in any of that, but that they have a place to go to. I know that music can be really powerful for a lot of young people, um, either listening to music or making music. There's a question, um, empowerment. My kids do a lot of service in the community and the neighborhood, but like to be served at home and can be independent when they wanna be. How can we transition them to more independency? Good question. So this will depend on your particular child, um, but there you know, there's there's something around um, that nurturing that can happen at meal times, for example. So, being able to nurture our children at meal time, or a meal doesn't have to be necessarily breakfast, lunch, dinner, but even just like three or four meal times throughout the week where you're actually serving them. That's that's okay. That's okay. It's not that they're not going to be independent. It's that there there's that there, there's a moment for bonding. I mean, culturally, we bond over food. Like that's one of the things that happens in around the world, right? And so it's okay that they're like to be served, but then maybe they can become part of the the group that's serving. Sometimes, maybe sometimes it's them serving um, the adults, 
right? So just having a little bit of fun with it and not making it like you need to be more independent. It's like, hey, um, you know, I thought maybe you guys could figure out dinner on Friday and, and then you guys can let us know what we're eating. Now they might order skip the dishes. So you have to <laughs> put some parameters around it. Um, but that would be one way of, of giving them um, responsibilities and opportunities and then not micromanaging it right? Not saying you need to make dinner on Friday and you need to make spaghetti and meat sauce and let me help you with the meat sauce because you don't really know what you're doing. No, you want to say you're in charge of dinner on Friday. We are not ordering skip the dishes. Um, and this is the food that we have in the fridge. Go for it, right? So, so it's giving them that agency and it might be like a horrible meal. Possible, but you're giving them those opportunities rather than forcing them to be independent, give them opportunities and um, and let them fail. <laughs> they might fail as well. That's okay if they fail sometimes. So um, religious community. We found that youth who are involved in religious communities um, tend to be less at risk for uh, risk-taking behaviors as well. So the next two, commitment to learning and positive values. So commitment to learning is really interesting that it, when, when young people are actually wanting to learn, that helps them um, feel better about themselves. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean academics. I want to be really clear about this, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be, quote unquote, smart. What it means is that they're interested in learning. So they're reading for pleasure. They're trying to learn about something that's interesting to them. Um, they're engaged at school and maybe not in like math and science. Maybe they're engaged in drama and choir class, whatever, but there's an engagement in the school. Um, there's homework. Kids who do homework <laughs> stay out of trouble a little bit for that amount of time that they're doing their homework. Um, but having to bring something home because it bridges um, school and home. Homework helps to bridge that. Now, hopefully we're giving them homework that's not just busy work and actually helping them to deepen their concepts and their ideas. Uh, but homework does, kids who engage in homework are more protected. Um, feeling a bond to the school. So feeling that school spirit, that's actually a real thing. That when kids feel bonded to their school, it's, it's better for them overall. And then achievement motivation, being motivated by achievement. And so for the high achievers, like they've, they've got probably, they've got this one for sure. Right. And then they might have some of these other ones if they're more academically um, inclined or there's a lot of good things happening at school that they're achieving about. This one's important, positive values, because this now is about your individual youth and what's important to them. And they looked at all these values, like so many, so many, 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 many dozens and dozens of values. And they distilled down to these six that when youth um, strongly value these six areas, they do better. So let's go through them. Responsibility, right? So that question about how do we make them more independent, you give them response, being responsible as, as a value, something that they want to be responsible. Um, being an in integrity. So living up to their own internal standard, following their own moral compass, being an in integrity with themselves. Um, equality and social justice, thinking about other people and their impact on other people is important. Honesty. Honesty with themselves, honesty with others. Caring. And this one's interesting. Restraint. Being able to set boundaries, being able to say no sometimes. And sometimes in families, we don't really set our kids up for, for success in this area of restraint because we don't necessarily teach them how to say no <laughs> to us. And so that's something that's important. We have to be able, our kids have to be able to say no to us so that they can say no to others in the world eventually. Now there's a limit, right? You kind of have to navigate that a little bit, but it is an important value that they don't just jump into something they can, they can hold back and decide before they take a step. They have that restraint. And the last group here, um, and, and I, I left this for last, again, it's no particular order, but I left this for last because this, the positive identity piece is usually what we think of when we think, oh, how's my kid going to do well? Oh, they feel good about themselves, so they're going to do well, right? But notice self-esteem is there, but it's only one of the 40 assets. So there's a, there could be a child who doesn't have good self-esteem, but has all of these other things going on for them. They'll do well. Imagine that they'll actually do well because they've got all of these other protective factors in place. Um, having a sense of purpose, um, feeling a sense of personal power and agency, um, having a positive view of their own personal future. So when they look to the next five years, they can see something good happening. That's really important. 
And then social competency. So these are the things that help them kind of um, thrive in society. So things like resistance skills. We talked about resistance again. So not just having resistance as a value, but having skills to say no, having skills to slow down and not just jump in. Um, that's important. Interpersonal competence, notice knowing how to deal with other people at all levels, like their peer group, also adults, also people younger than them, how to navigate that space. Um, cultural competence, right? And and for those who are like straddling several cultures, right? How do you how do you manage and walk through the different cultures that you're a part of? Planning and decision making is really important, um, as well as peaceful conflict resolution. So I know that was a lot of information, <laughs> 40 assets, and hopefully you jotted down some notes. Um, but I'm just gonna pause here and just see if there are um, particular questions about the 40 asset model. Actually, I'm going to move to the next part. Write your questions in the chat if if you have them. Um, as you went through and you looked at your tallies, hopefully you were doing your tallies as we went. Um, it would be interesting for me to know, and maybe you can write this in the chat. How? What were your numbers? What was your number for your youth and or yourself? What? How many tallies out of forty did you get as you were going through? If you did that exercise. Okay. I'm just going to give a minute to be able to do that. Type it in the chat. It'd just be interesting to know, you know, how many how many of the assets did you have as a young person, and and or your youth, and you might not have done any of that because you were too busy listening and taking notes. That's fine. No test. No test. <laughs> okay. So I want to switch gears and talk about mental health, right? So we've talked about stress and coping, and you saw like kind of 40 things that you can support um, your youth in experiencing or having kind of. Uh, padding around them to give them more resilience um, and now I want to talk about their mental health in particular so there's um, the Canadian mental uh, sorry the mental health commission of Canada has developed this mental health continuum model and so there's kind of there the way that they did it was was different than the way it's done before because in the past we've often thought of mental health as the absence of mental illness I'm going to say that again Mental health as the absence of mental illness, which is not correct. Mental health is like physical health. We all have physical health. Sometimes we're doing well. Sometimes we're doing poorly. We all have mental health. Sometimes we're doing well. Sometimes we're doing poorly. And so this continuum helps us to um, kind of plot ourselves or gauge where we are as far as our mental health in general. So you can have a mental illness or not. Doesn't matter but this continuum applies to everyone. So when they're healthy, when somebody's in a place of green, um, you know, there's normal fluctuations in mood, they have a sense of humor, um, they're confident in themselves and others, there's consistent performance, um, they're kind of engaging with their friends and they're engaging in things they like to do. Um, and they're, they're, they're kind of like, just basically feeling good. Now we can't live there, right? Like nobody lives there forever. There are times when we'll be in the reacting stage or the yellow stage, and that's where we're irritable and nervous, uh, maybe displaced sarcasm, having some trouble sleeping, maybe forgetfulness, um, missing deadlines, um, maybe starting to engage in some of those those riskier behaviors that that you you know you you know are best for them. So this this is yellow, and so the hope is that as caregivers and parents, that we start noticing when our kids are here and maybe even here, and we don't wait until crisis. Um, the Canadian Mental Health Association has a campaign called Before Stage 4. And what they're saying is, you know, with something like cancer, um, if somebody came into the hospital with stage 2 cancer, uh, the, the doctors are going to do something about that, right? They're not going to wait till it's terminal and then do something. But when it comes to mental health, it seems like in our medical system, we wait until somebody's like suicidal in the, you know, an, an emergency, and that's when they get access to resources. And so the idea is don't wait until we get into the red zone, right? Catch it earlier and provide those interventions earlier. Um, and so if you know that, if you kind of understand that there's a continuum and we'll fluctuate, right? We'll be maybe green to yellow, sometimes orange, but not letting it get all the way to red. So that's yellow. Um, orange is when there's like real anxiety now, sadness, um, kind of being on the verge of tears or tearfulness a lot. Um, they maybe have trouble um, 
the trouble with decision making. They're now avoiding and withdrawing from their friends and their social group, having a hard time concentrating. So this is where it's kind of injured. And they use this physical health kind of language, right? Healthy, reacting, injured and ill. Um, and this was actually developed for first responders um, because there was at a time still, but not as much, but before a lot of stigma around mental health and getting support for your mental health. And it's reminding people that, you know, it's it's something that you can get help for that is nothing, there's nothing wrong with you because you're in the orange. You're just in the orange and try to get back to the green. The red is now panic attacks, um, rage, aggression, depression, numbness, um, can't sleep, can't concentrate, fatigued. Maybe they're moving into addiction now. Maybe they're absent, like consistently absent from school or their activities. So it come, it doesn't just go from healthy to red. Like it doesn't go from green to red. We go down the path. And so if you're paying attention, you can see and look for the signs and help them get back to the green. And it's actually really helpful to teach young people about this because then they can help their friends. Often young people will turn to their friends first before their parents um, when they're not doing well. So knowing that, oh, this is a real thing and I can watch and support my friends as they're getting into yellow and orange to come back to the green. So we're kind of close to the end. Uh, we have about five minutes. I also did want to leave a little bit of time for any other questions. So if you have a question, type it in the chat. Otherwise, I'm just going to do our last slide here. So what I wanted to think about here was strategies that you've used to get your kids back into the green. So when you've watched and they're starting to not do well and not do well, Likely you haven't waited, hopefully you've caught it before it got to red. So in the orange and the yellow zone, what have you done to help your kids come back to the green? I thought we might just put our heads together around that. We're a room full of parents here. Um, like how often do you have a room full of parents giving each other good parenting advice? What do you do to help your kids come back to the green? Especially your high achieving kids. Any ideas or thoughts? One of the things I'll share a little bit about what I do as you're kind of thinking and writing. Um, one of the things that I do and that I recommend to my clients to do with their kids is um, a drive or a walk together. And you're not talking. You're not trying to talk. You're not trying to get them to say anything. Just that presence together because um, it, it provides an opening and a window for them if they want to talk. You could say something like, I noticed you're kind of you, you, you're kind of not yourself these days. Is there anything I could do to support you? Um, taking the focus. So someone's suggesting taking the focus away from the adults and putting the focus back on the kids, being there for them. By the time your kids are teenagers, um, they've come along a lot, right? Like you're living your life and they're coming along and they're coming along. And by the time they become teenagers, they might resist the coming along with doing everything that the family is doing. So sometimes it's interesting and for the whole family to see what it is that the kids are interested in doing. Where can you come along with them, actually? Right. I remember when I was about 17, I did this fundraiser, or I was part of this fundraiser in Calgary, um, where they have the Calgary Tower. It's like a really tall tower. And the fundraiser was for a wildlife organization, and you had to raise money and then walk up the stairs of the tower. And my mom came to that and she sat at the bottom of the tower and waited for me to walk up the tower and walk back down. But I felt so like celebrated and supported. And then she kind of like had a balloon for me at the end that she got from the gift shop. And it was just so nice. Like my thing, she came and she has absolutely no interest in saving animals or walking up a tower, but she was there, right? She showed up. One-on-one -on -one time is a good one. Uh, going for a special dinner, just me and, and my child. Great. And that's something that you can start even before they reach the teenager. So it becomes kind of a ritual in the family. Any other suggestions of how to help your kids come back to the green? Any other ideas? So be there with them. Take the focus away from us. Put it back on them. Spend some special time with them one on one. One, one other thing, you know, going back to that earlier question about nurturing is sometimes they, they might just kind of want to be babied. Um, and you might notice this at bedtime, right? So keeping up with that bedtime routine. Now, it's sometimes hard because they often go to sleep really late, like way later than you. So it can be hard. But even just once a week or so, um, 
being there with them at bedtime because that's a very kind of tender time and it can bring them back to you know being littler and what bedtime meant around that time somebody's saying i've sat with my child as he cried so important don't try to fix it just be there with them as they're having their feelings um just being a soothing presence rather than a fixer of their problems would, is really really helpful Part of that, sitting with them as they cry, the message you're giving them is, I trust that you're strong enough to get through this feeling. And I'm here to support you in that, but I'm not going to fix it for you because I trust that you're strong enough and you'll make it through. So that's a great one, sitting there as they're having feelings and not only as they cry, as they rage. <laughs> right? That's another emotion. Being there with them as they rage and not being reactive about it and making it about you, but being able to hold that whatever's coming at you and not make it about you. Asking them what they need. Sometimes when the dialogue is open and they're vulnerable, they let me know. And I let them know that I'm open to hearing what I'm doing wrong. That's that's really, I think this is a very kind of new generation approach. And it's so powerful to say, is there places I can improve? <laughs> is there things that you wish I was doing that I'm not doing? Um, it, it gives a little bit of agency back to them in a time when they don't have a lot of control. And a lot of things are out of control in their brains and in their bodies to give them a little bit of agency to say, is there something that you wish we would do more often? Or is there something that I do that kind of upsets you or annoys you that I might change? They may or may not answer. But the fact that you're even asking, powerful. So we could probably sit here all night and talk about ideas and suggestions, um, but we are at our time. So I'm going to um, pass it back to Rick to move to closing. There we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Syra. That was another wonderful, wonderful, informative presentation. Um, it just made me think about, um, we had our opening celebration for our Wellness Center a few weeks ago, and we had a student speaker um, attend, and she talked about uh, her own mental health journey and how much the Wellness Center and um, our district clinical counselor has supported her, and she didn't want anything in return. She just It was that service piece, and she just wanted students to to be aware that the service is there and it's okay to ask for help. And her mom was in, this, in the audience, like watching and listening to her as well. So there was the support piece too. So that's just kind of what, what made me um, your, um, what people were saying in the chat and um, your testimonials and everything, what um, that's what came to mind for me. So Thank you so much, Dr. Syra, uh, for everyone attending. Thank you for taking the time uh, to spend your Wednesday evening with us. I will put a link in the chat that will just show you where you can find the presentation on our district website, and then also on Dragonfly TV on YouTube, you will be able to find it there as well. So we should have that up in the next couple of days. Um, in the meantime, have a wonderful evening, great rest of the school year, summer, and we hope that we'll be able to bring Dr. Syra back in uh, next year. So thank you everyone again very much and thank you dr syra thank you everyone thanks for coming good night